everybody. I'd like to go ahead and get started. We have Dr. Greg Lowry, who is the Walter Blanco Senior Professor, Senior Pro Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Carnegie Mellon University. He's the Deputy Director of the NSF EPA Center for Environmental Implications of Nanotechnology and the Associate Editor of Environmental Science Nano in Nature Scientific Data. His research focuses on the use of nanomaterial, but um, in speaking with him, I've learned that a more <coughs> correct term is advanced materials. Uh, I guess nano is getting different. Stale. stale yeah. yeah, so uh, we, he focuses in on advanced materials. And um, what he does with these advanced materials is he looks at um, innovative water treatment processes. And also, very interestingly, also looks at use of nano, advanced nanomaterials in uh, agriculture and in crop production, um, which is a new twist and uh, application in how plants um, can utilize these materials. Um, as far as his accomplishments, he's authored more than 140 peer-reviewed journals, articles. He served as PI or co-PI on grants from the National Science Foundation, the U.S. Department of Defense, U.S. Department of Energy, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. He also serves on the board of directors of the Association of Environmental Engineering and Science Professors, and recently served on the U.S. EPA Science Advisory Board. Until they fired me. <laughs> I've been fired. By well, Trump got rid of us. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, he's a member of the National Academy of Science Committee on Science Breakthroughs in 2030, a strategy for food and agricultural research, and served on the National Research Council Committee to develop a research strategy for environmental health and safety aspects of engineered nanomaterials. At this point, I'd like to hand it over to Dr. Lowry. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Helen. <clears throat> so um, thank you all for being here at 6 o'clock. I'm not sure if we did this at 6 o'clock at my university. I'm not sure what the turnout would be, but at least you get to eat. Um, so I'm here to, to tell you a kind of a story, I guess, of the last 10 years or so of research in my group um, that actually started when I was a postdoc. I learned this uh, synchro synchrotron X-ray methods uh, for looking at metals in various matrices, environmental matrices like soils and sediments. And I've sort of carried that through my career. And I'm going to, it's, it's a bit of a tutorial on synchrotron X-ray and what it can do. But hopefully I'll convince you that if you want to understand nanomaterial behavior in these systems, complicated ones, you know, like plants and like people, the only way to do it is with synchrotron X-ray spectroscopy. There really is no other way to, to do it. So before I start, <clears throat> clearly I have to acknowledge all the people that have done the work. Most of what I'm going to show you today um, is done by John Stegmaier who graduated and, and moved to Colorado and works in the oil and gas industry. Uh, Eleanor Spielman's son, who is going to graduate uh, soon, um, probably in May. Uh, and she'll move on maybe to Cornell or maybe to a synchrotron, because she really likes this stuff. Um, Astrid Aulon and Clément Lavard are both postdocs from, from a CNRS lab called the Serej. In, uh, in the south of France. I got to spend the whole summer in Aix-en-Provence in France at this lab. It was pretty nice. If you've ever been to the south of France, you, you, you know what I mean. Um, and then Will Gao is a student in my group looking at nanomaterials in soils. And Garrett Bland is a new student um, looking at nanomaterials um, in, I guess, Department of Defense applications, let's say. It's a new grant that we just got, and he's going to be looking at those things. But I'm training him on, on x-ray. So x-ray is not something you just walk in and do. It takes a long time to learn how to do this. It probably takes three, four, maybe five trips to the synchrotron with people that know what they're doing so you can learn how to do it and, and collect data that's useful and, and work the data, analyze the data. So anyway, that's, that's, part of, that's about half of my research group right now. <clears throat> so for those of you who don't know what nanotechnology is, um, I just throw this in. There is a definition that if you have a material and has a dimension of 1 to 100 nanometers, and that could be any dimension, that could be one of three dimensions, could be all three dimensions, but it has to be lower than 100 nanometers. And the second part of the definition is that you have unique properties that arise because it's small. And I have to say, most of the nanotechnology research that's done, especially in the environmental field, doesn't really have this going for it. 
It's unique and different because it's a particle instead of an ion for metals, but it's not necessarily really unique. And I'll show you an example of that. Um, but that uniqueness comes from lattice deformations and structural defects and these kinds of things in, in the crystalline structure that, that arise because the material is small. Okay, so that's... <clears throat> That unique material, unique properties of materials, um, have a lot of promise, okay? And this is what this is what drove me to this first. I, I first started doing nanomaterials in 2000, 2001, looking at uh, groundwater remediation with nanomaterials. These days, we're doing a lot with agriculture. Both of those are quite promising in terms of opportunities for nanomaterials to to make things better. Uh, water treatment, energy production, um, medicine. Uh, is a big one. You know, you can imagine carbon nanotubes, for example, giving you much lighter, much stronger materials. You get better mileage. So there's a whole bunch of opportunities for nanomaterials out there. <clears throat> and, and nanomaterials have really evolved. They've changed quite a bit um, over the years. So when I first started thinking about this and working on this, this was a nanomaterial. Right? This is an iron zero core, just metallic iron. It's quite reactive with groundwater contaminants. And it has this iron oxide shell on the outside of it. And in 1997, I could write a grant to the National Science Foundation with that picture and get lots of money. They're like, wow, that's really cool. It's small, it's interesting, let's, let's fund this kind of stuff. Well, it didn't take long before that became not so interesting. And then by 2005, we had to put coatings on the outside of particles to give them some functionality, make them go where we want it, make them behave the way we want it to behave. And then things really took off. You know, 2010, we started making materials like gold nanoparticles, you know, tethered with a piece of DNA with these little nano silver wires attached to it. And that was a single molecule detection system. It was pretty, pretty cool stuff. We started making things like cadmium selenide nanowires that just don't exist in nature, but they're useful for us. And then, you know, just last night I went to ACS Nano, which is where I go. And, you know, these are brand new articles, just came out, but this is like a titanium sulfide layer that they're exfoliating off of the surface. So making a thin layer of material with unique properties. This exfoliation is big, like graphene and these kinds of things. Um, and then this other one I found was was um, basically these, these small nanoparticles that made little nano bubbles. They're boron nitride materials or car carbon nitride materials. They make little bubbles in their little micromotors that move. So people are starting to actually make things with nanomaterials. To be honest, we're still, from looking at implications, we're still kind of stuck back here. And what was interesting is around 2005, 2006, when new materials started being made, people got concerned. People started saying, wait a minute, these are new materials. These are new chemicals. They have new properties. We have to start thinking about whether they're going to be the next PCB or they're going to be another contaminant in the environment. <clears throat> and that was fortunate for me um, because we went to the National Science Foundation with a proposal that ultimately got funded. Um, we had $30 million to look at things over, over about a 10-year period. It, by we, it, it, this is a big group of people with lots of students involved. We're currently in year 11. We still have a little money left, so we're spending it out. <clears throat> um, but the idea in this center was to understand whether people are being exposed to nanomaterials and understand um, what they're being exposed to. What is the form of the material you're being exposed to? Is it going to be a problem? Right? So are you exposed? How do they move around in the environment? What constitutes exposure? And then is there any hazard resulting from those things? Because together, of course, if you know if you're exposed and you know if there's a hazard, combined it doesn't show up here very well, but that's risk characterization. So our center was designed to look at the risk of these materials. But probably the most important thing was, was this one, right? These nanomaterials were going into the environment and they're gonna move around and they're gonna change. And the question is, how do you monitor and track that? <clears throat> so one of the real key outcomes that we had from our center, um, not, you know, I, I sort of led this effort in particular and did a lot of the work in this space, but there were many others that did synchrotron work for the, for the center. But one of the key outputs of our center, I think, was to really understand, elucidate all these transformations that these nanomaterials uh, could undergo when they went in the environment. And we looked, like I said, we're, we're sort of stuck back here in these first generation materials. But we looked at lots of these different materials and we looked at multiple environments and I'm gonna show you some results from all these different kinds of environments like this is biosolids from a wastewater treatment plant being sprayed onto a crop. That's a good source of, of engineered nanomaterials, of course, transformed ones. <clears throat> and the idea is how do they transform and change and then 
What are the new properties that they get? Because it's the new properties of those materials that control their fate, control how they move around, control if you're going to have any toxicity associated with them. We were talking about this earlier, right? As things age, they become less toxic. And we actually found that to be true for many of these materials as well. All right. So in 10 years, I ran one experiment. Okay? Not really one experiment, but one type of experiment. So just about everything that we did in our lab, we took nanomaterials and we put them into a system. We either exposed them to chemicals in a laboratory in a very well-controlled system, or we exposed them to organisms like nematodes, or we put them out into a freshwater wetland mesocosm, a real natural environment. We just threw them into this environment. And then we said, okay, well, how are they changing? Well, the way we did it is we would collect these tissues and we would go to a to an, uh, synchrotron and we would do x-ray absorption spectroscopy or x-ray fluorescence microscopy to sort of look at where the materials were and how they had changed. And so it's amazing that you can have 20 PhD students over 10 years all do the same exact experiment with different materials, of course, and different organisms, but same concept. So expose and then characterize what you have. And we look at dissolved species as well, but mostly it's the solids and how the solids are changing that really matter to us. All right, so how do we do that? A lot of you probably aren't familiar with synchrotron. Okay, there's a number of facilities in the US. Department of Energy runs these facilities. There's one in Brookhaven National Lab. I was just there on Friday and Saturday. <clears throat> um, there's one at Stanford, SSRL. <laughs> we go to Stanford a lot. Um, there's one in Chicago, APS. Right, those, are, those are sort of the main ones in the US. So I'm not going to go through all of this, but I'm just going to tell you sort of how this works. You have a booster ring and you basically throw electrons into a system, okay? And you're spinning electrons around a big circle. So I'll show you a picture of these. These are really big circles, like, you know, hundreds of meters across kind of numbers. And if I take an electron and I bend it, okay? So these wigglers, they bend electrons. If I have an electron moving, you probably remember this from physics, if I have an electron moving and I bend it, you have to let off some energy somewhere. Well, that energy is an x-ray, okay? So every time I bend an electron, here I bend an electron, the, the, the x-rays come off, okay? I bend an electron, the x-rays come off. So all along the beam line are these lines where the x-rays are coming off. Now what's neat about these x-rays is they're very focused in energy, and then we can use them to probe these systems. I'll show you, we can do some chemistry with them, okay? So this is sort of a basic X-ray absorption spectroscopy setup. This is the one at Stanford. It's beamline 11.2. It looks rather unassuming. Um, we basically take our material, whether it's a soil or a smushed up worm or, or hydrocarbon. We actually did a lot of work with an oil company and we looked at uh, mercury in various uh, hydrocarbons and crude oils and in sediments from tanks and these kinds of things. We basically take those and put them into these sample holders. We either make pellets or we put them into the sample holder. And then what you do is you put them in front of a beam. So the beam, the X-ray beam, very high energy, high intensity X-ray beam, but well focused, is going through. It hits your sample, and then you can measure how much absorbs with a detector here. And that's fine if you have a lot of concentration, high concentrations of metals. But we had very low concentrations of metals. So what we actually do is It'll absorb an, uh, an X-ray, and then it will a core electron is ejected, and then as the electrons drop down, it re-emits X-rays, and we collect the fluorescence that's coming off of that sample over here with this detector right here. So we are looking at X-ray fluorescence of different elements in our sample at low concentrations. Okay? In the bulk, in this case, it's a bulk. So the whole sample, you're looking at an average of the material in the sample. All right. So what do you actually get from this? Okay, again, you have your x-ray beam coming in, it hits your sample, it absorbs, and then it will fluoresce off. And what you see, you're measuring absorbance as you're increasing the x-ray energy. Okay, so for a while you get absolutely no absorbance, right? This pre-edge feature is kind of dropping down a little bit. And then for, for the element that you have, there's a specific energy where you're going to absorb a lot of energy quickly. And you can measure that. Okay, so this very first part where it jumps up and then wiggles just a little bit, that's called the Zanes region, right? X-ray absorption near edge structure. This is giving you very short range order in the molecule, electronic structures, if you will. But it also gives you a fingerprint and you can understand what you have there. Okay, if you keep going further out in energy, you end up in what we call the XAFS region, which is X-ray absorption, uh, um, extended X-ray absorption fluorescence spectroscopy. That's this part. And this part gives you 
um, a little bit more information about the material farther away from the central atom. Okay, so for example, if I have a metal atom that I'm probing, with these squiggles right here, I can figure out exactly how many atoms, how many of these red atoms are around this central atom. I can figure out what distance they are. I can really understand how this metal is in the system. Now, if it's a nanomaterial, I can also know that it's a nanomaterial based on its properties. So I can use these to identify nanomaterials in samples. I can use them to identify if the nanomaterial has changed because I'll know if it's changed, I'll know the atoms around it have changed. Okay, so this is, this is basically what we do. We either look at the Zanes region here, and you can see here's an example of like chromium-3 versus chromium-6. That's the Zanes region of chromium-3, that's the Zanes region of chromium-6. Totally different. So you get this fingerprint, you can identify things um, pretty easily with this method. And I'll tell you why it's really important um, in a second when you have mixed metals in a sample. All right, so, so why do we need this? Well, we can answer key questions around nanomaterials. Are nanomaterials really unique? I'll show you some, some interesting data about that. Have the nanoparticles changed? And if they have changed, how have they changed? And we're talking about changes in soils and in plants and in earthworms and various, various organisms, okay? If you tried to do this any other way, you have all kinds of problems. You have s sample handling uh, can affect things. So if I have to dry the sample or if I have to extract the particles somehow with a acid or some kind of treatment, you're affecting the environment it's in and you're changing the particle because these particles are quite reactive. So we can do this in situ. I can take, I can actually take a worm and put it into a beam. I usually dry it and, or, or uh, lyophilize it and crush it up first, but you'll see some of the things we do with x-ray fluorescence, we can just put the worm right in, right? So x-ray absorption spectroscopy is the only method that can give you in situ metal speciation of these materials. And this is really why we use it. So here's, here's one example, okay? This is, this is early work. So this is a while ago, it's from 2012. Um, so work was probably done in 11. We just had this very simple question. Are silver nanoparticles unique? Is there something special? Because, you know, the town of Berkeley outlawed silver nanoparticles in their washing machines. You probably don't remember this because this was some years ago, but they banned silver in washing machines because everyone was afraid this new material was going to destroy us all and, and harm us all. Okay, so we just set out to say, all right, are they really unique? Are they special from a molecular point of view? So we made a bunch of nanoparticles and they had different coatings, PVP or gum arabic, but we had six nanometers all the way up to some sort of bulk size materials, okay? And the first thing we did was we just measured their dissolution rates, right? So we have all these particles and you would think, all right, different sizes, you get different dissolution rates. But if I surface area normalize, I should get the same value. Well, it turns out if you actually look at the solubility relative to the bulk as a function of size, right? And going this direction, things are getting smaller because right, it's one over the diameter. So these are my smallest particles. You, do, you get this line. They, have, they do get more soluble as they get smaller. Okay, that was interesting. But then when you model it, right, you model it with this Oswald equation and you get a surface energy. And don't, don't worry about all the details, but this, the, this is the, the diameter of the particle, so the solubility is a function of diameter. But here's the surface energy. Okay, that tells you something about the stress and the strain on the material and how reactive it would be. Well, it turns out you only get a straight line if this is a constant value. And it was a constant value. And it was a constant value about the same as bulk silver. Okay, so there's, it feels like there's nothing too special about these nanoparticles. They're behaving exactly like we think they should behave. Okay, but this wasn't good enough, right? We could speculate that. So we said, okay, well, what can we do with x-ray to figure that out? So we went and did a couple of things. We do x-ray absorption spectroscopy, and these are sort of the spectra you get, and these are different size materials. And we also did, we did pair distribution function analysis, which is sort of total x-ray scattering that we also do on the synchrotron. And you know, you don't, you don't have to be an expert to look at these and look at these and say, there's no difference. They're all the same. Even down to six nanometers, there is no, absolutely no difference in these spectra, which tells me that the, the, the FCC um, structure of silver, which is what this is, and all these bond distances in the crystal lattice are all the same, all the way down to six nanometers. So this totally changed the way I thought about nanomaterials. All of a sudden, there's nothing unique. Even down to six nanometers, these are just small particles of the same exact stuff we've been working on before. Okay? And this is true of a lot of materials. There's very few materials, nan nanomaterials, that you get down below 20 and 10 nanometers and things start to change. I'm not gonna say there's zero, but there's very few. 
So that was sort of interesting. And then of course we started sulfidizing everything. All these metals that we were working with, silver and zinc and copper, they're, they're all chalcophilic metals, so they love sulfur. So we would just expose them and, and sulfidize everything and get these different materials. And then of course we could use x-ray. And what this shows you is the x-ray absorption spectroscopy for different uh, sulfur to zinc ratios. So we took our zinc oxide nanoparticles, exposed them to different sulfur, and as we go higher and higher and higher, clearly the zinc oxide spectrum is changing to something else. Turns out that this looks just like zinc sulfide, zinc sulfide nanoparticles, right? That spectra looks like that one. So you're taking zinc oxide and you're slowly converting it to zinc sulfide. Um, and, but we never got zero. It never went away. There's always this core of zinc oxide, which we can tell from that little, that little hump right there. This one is a zinc oxygen distance. This is a zinc sulfur distance. So I can tell that I have a little bit of zinc oxide there. So we use this, this spectroscopy to understand these materials and how they change, right? And we can go and look and with, we can analyze our spectra and we can say things like, what's the size? So this is my zinc oxide core. These are the crystals on the outside and these are zinc sulfide crystals and this is a zinc oxide core. And the size of those zinc sulfide crystals range from two and a half to about five, depending on how much sulfur I put in it. So I had this lovely zinc oxide particle that was being sulfidized and creating these little zinc, ox zinc sulfide crystals. So we can start to understand our system fully uh, this way. Okay, but that's, that's in the lab. Great. Laboratory-based stuff is fun, it's interesting, and you can control it well. But what about the real world? What happens when I take my zinc oxide and put it into a wastewater treatment plant? Or I take any of those nanomaterials, silver or copper, and I put them into a freshwater wetland. And you know, we had this really great facility in our center where we could basically mimic in, in reproducible systems, an emergent freshwater wetland. And we could put nanoparticles in without risk of getting them, you know, exposing a real system. And we can really look at how they behave. And these are, these are as close as you can get to reality without actually being in a real system. It, now, it's low throughput, it's very expensive to run, but this is what you can do with a center, right? You have the ability to sort of converge around a big, a big experimental facility like this. <clears throat> All right, so how does, how does X-ray help us do this? So this is an important piece of, of X-ray absorption spectroscopy, okay? It is metal specific, okay? So what this is showing you is the absorption of chromium, manganese, iron, cobalt, nickel, copper, zinc, and this is the energy, right? So the X-ray energy for chromium, somewhere around 6200, it's gonna jump, and I get the Zanes region, and I get, I get the XAFs region, and it's not all the way out here until here, that I start to get manganese, which of course is the next one in the periodic table. So I, if, I, if I just collect data over that energy spectrum, I'm only seeing chromium, or I'm only seeing iron if I'm in this spectrum. So no matter what's in your sample, no matter how much metal, sort of, a caveat to that, if you're using fluorescence, everything fluoresces, you have to watch out for that. But if I'm interested in a specific metal, I can look at just that metal. That's what's really great about X-ray absorption spectroscopy. And if I want, I can look at this metal, and then I can go back at the same sample, and I can look at this metal, and I can go back and look for this metal. So it's kind of nice. You can actually look for different metals in different, different systems. Okay? So this is why we do it. Because in situ, metal specific, and I can really understand the chemistry of my system. All right, so here's, this was a pilot system. This was not part of my center, but it was part of this other center that we got. We got this uh, like a $5 million grant from the EPA uh, somewhere around the middle. It was called TINY, Transatlantic Initiative for Nanotechnology and the Environment. This was actually in the UK, Cranfield University in the UK. But we put zinc oxide nanoparticles into like a, a wastewater treatment plant, essentially. So what this is is a slipstream from a real wastewater treatment plant that's that headworks that's coming into the Cranfield. And we mimic the complete process, right? From primary settling to some, some activated sludge and then some digestion. We go through the whole process and we put the nanoparticles in the front of the process like they were entering the system, okay? And then we look at the biosolids at the end because remember I showed you that picture where we take biosolids from treatment plants and then we spray them on crops, right? We, we do that, the UK does that. That's a source of nanomaterials in the environment. So we wanted to understand what's happening to that zinc oxide uh, when, we're, when it goes through the treatment plant system and it leaves, okay? Now, what was really interesting about it, and there's a lot, there was a bunch of papers, right? This was a 2014 paper. Right around 12, 13, there was a bunch of papers about zinc oxide in the environment and even wastewater treatment plants. 
And they would measure, they would put zinc oxide in and they would measure zinc at the end and they would say, oh, the zinc oxide is moving through the system. Well, we put zinc oxide in and we measured the speciation of zinc leaving the system. And it turns out if you look at zinc speciation, you get zinc sulfide, you get zinc phosphates, and you get zinc on ferrihydrite. What you don't get is any zinc oxide nanoparticles whatsoever. They dissolved and they sulfidized or they adsorbed onto ferrihydrites. So if you're talking about zinc oxide, if you're doing experiments with zinc oxide in biosolids on, on fields, that's sort of a silly experiment because there is no zinc oxide. Okay? Now, what was interesting, though, and we still haven't figured this one out, is if you look closely at the ability of a, a soybean to nodulate, um, if it, in our control experiment and our, if we add bulk zinc, we get pretty good nodulation. But with the same amount of zinc in our nanomaterial one, we didn't get nodulation with the biosolids used. But we did with, with bulk zinc and with, with, uh, with control, which has a lot, your wastewater has a lot of zinc in it already. We don't know why that is. We really don't because there's no zinc oxide nanoparticles coming out. This probably has to do something with um, a different distribution of zinc in the biosolids, right? But speciation-wise, didn't matter if it was control ion or nanoparticle. They all looked just about exactly the same. So th this one's still an open question. I'm not sure what to do about that one. <clears throat> All right, so we also looked at these nanoparticle transformations in wetlands. We wanted to know how fast they occurred. We wanted to know if they occurred. And we did things like put copper oxide and copper sulfide into a, into a mesocosm or silver zero and silver sulfide. And we wanted to know, does the initial form entering have any impact? If I put a reactive material in, what does it transform into? And how quickly does that happen? We wanted the kinetics of this particular system. And we were a little bit surprised by some of this. So. Just to make a, a long story short, if, for the copper oxide nanoparticles we put in, if you go and you look at the sediments, so this is the sediments, we took, we basically took sediment out of the bottom of these tanks and we prepared them, we did x-ray absorption spectroscopy on okay? And then what we found was one month, three months, six months, and nine months after we dose, if you look at these squiggles, right, those squiggles look a lot like copper sulfide. And a lot of that material, even after one month, there was no copper oxide left at all. It had all transformed to copper sulfide. Okay? So that was kind of almost expected, actually, because there's a fair amount of sulfur in these sediments, and you sort of expect that to happen. What we didn't expect was a lot of the copper ended up with these plants, Egeria densa, which grows under the water in these systems. And it actually filters the water, so it takes a lot of particles out. Um, if you look closely, one month, three months, and six months, you'll see this little, this little peak right here. Well, that peak is what you'd expect for the copper oxide nanoparticle. So those plants were taking up the copper oxide nanoparticles and somehow preventing them from dissolving or sulfidizing or changing, right? So if you went in and said, okay, I put copper in and it, it all sulfidizes, no problem. That's fine, it does, unless it gets in the plant and then it doesn't sulfidize right away. So if you're doing toxicology studies, what do you do? Do I do toxicology of copper sulfide or do I do copper, copper oxide? Well, it depends. If you're doing a sediment dwelling organism, that's probably the one you'd want to think about. If you're doing plants, this is probably the one you'd want to think about. So this x-ray work really helps. And this, this surprised us a lot. I did not expect this to happen at all. Okay. Now I'm going to tell you about a failed experiment that ended up in Nature Nanotechnology. And it says impressed, but I think it's got a number now, but I didn't, I didn't find it. But it, it just came out fairly recently. But I, I will admit, it was a failed experiment. So what we did was we took these gold nanoparticles and we put them into our mesocosms. And what we wanted to do with them was understand where they went. Because they're inert, they don't transform, they don't change, they're a particle tracer. If we could find gold, and there's very little background, we'd know where particles went. Okay? So we put them in these things with very low, low doses, like microgram kind of, per liter kind of numbers, every week for nine months. And we went and we looked at these egeria plants and we collected them up. Right? And then we figured, okay, there's going to be some silver with Egeria. It turns out, this is a, this is a, a very busy thing and it hasn't been published yet, but um, a lot of the material, 88% of the gold that we put in actually was associated with these plants. So the plants were taking up most of the gold that we were putting in the system because they were filtering the particles. That's what they do. They help keep the water clear. Okay. So most of the gold was present with those particles. So of course, we looked at it and we figured, okay, boring, we'll do x-ray, we'll look at, we'll find gold zero and we'll move on. Well, it turned out when we did it, 
this is the spectra that we got of the gold inside these plants. It was gold 1 cyanide, gold 3 hydroxide, and gold 1 sulf sulfhydryl. There was no gold nanoparticles. Those plants had taken my inert gold particle tracer and converted it, and it changed it. And they changed it to these different species, which we never would have figured out if we hadn't done the X-ray absorption spectroscopy on it. Okay? And it turns out, the, you know, you can read the paper to get the whole story, but there's epiphytes that grow on Edensa. The epiphytes release cyanide. The cyanide promotes the oxidation of the gold nanoparticles, and then it gets taken up in the plants as these species and not gold nanoparticles. So the 20 papers that came before us saying that gold nanoparticles went up into plants, I'm not so convinced now. I don't think the particle went in the plant. I think the oxidation product of the particle went in the plant. All right? So it changes the way you think about the system. All right. So we started thinking about plants. And we're like, all right, plants are really cool. And of course, you guys know this. And you know, this, is a, this is a sort of a hot area of research right now, agriculture, trying to feed the world. Uh, by 2050, we expect 10 billion people. How are we going to feed everybody? We need to be more sustainable, etc. If you look closely, we use a lot of water. Uh, water, 70% of all water goes to agriculture. As much as 30% of energy use goes to agriculture. And we're not very good at it. Our soils are degraded. Climate change is causing us any problems, but we have to keep doing better. So we thought, wait, how can nanomaterials help agriculture? Because they interact with plants in ways that we didn't expect. So we are now working in this field and we're sort of coining this phrase. So feel free to use this phrase as much as you want because we want to get it out there. But we call, it, we call what we do plant nanobiotechnology. Okay? And there's two pieces of plant nanobiotechnology. One piece is that we, we take nanomaterials and we use them to probe and study plants and how they work and how they behave. Okay? That's one side of it. The other side of it is we actually use the nanomaterials to augment the plants with enhanced functionality. Okay? So we're, we're using nanomaterials to make the plants better, right? so sort of, sort of well, plant nanobiotechnology. And, and you, know, you can actually put nanoparticles in plants and use them as sensors. So this particular, I think it's a spinach plant, um, was modified so that if it encountered an energetic compound, like TNT in this case, I think it was, yeah, um, it would give a signal that you could pick up on your cell phone. So the plant was telling you that there is an explosive in the ground. You can imagine there's lots of uses for that. I think the Department of Defense probably funded that one. Um, we've been looking at sort of photosynthesis, and this guy named Juan Pablo Geraldo, who I'm um, working with now at UC Riverside, has been looking at putting like cerium oxide particles in leaves to make them do photosynthesis better, especially when they're under heat stress or salt stress. Right? Heat stress plants don't do well. And if you put plant heat stress, all that comes up is cannabis. Right? Because that's a big deal right now is heat, heat the, all the lights on cannabis and it burns them. Um, this, is, this is maize under some salt stress. They don't do well under those conditions. So how can we do better? Right? So nanomaterials are an important tool in our toolbox, I think. Right? So their the small size enables them to get entry into plants. And I'm going to show you. It's not easy, but it can be done. You know, this is a stomata on a plant. Right? That's where the gas exchange happens in a plant. Things can go in through stomata. Um, and they can also go through the cuticle. I'll show you in a minute if you do it right. Um, they're kinetically stable, so they slowly release metals like copper or zinc, which are nutrients for plants, so you get time. And most importantly, we can tune the surfaces of these particles so that we can make them go into the plants or make them go where we want them in the plants. And I'm going to show you that in a minute. All right, so here's an example of something that Juan Pablo Geraldo did uh, very recently. Cerium oxide, nanoceria, goes into the plant. Um, and associates with the chloroplasts. And sort of all you need to know here is that a lot of the, the cerium co-localizes with the chloroplasts. And when you do that um, for certain cerium, you get enhanced assimilation of carbon even under heat stress. So all this, all this plot is showing you, you can, you can look up all the details here, the plot is showing you that even though the plant is under heat stress, if we give them these cerium oxide particles, they are scavenging ROS and the plant is able to photosynthesize better than it did without the particles under that stressed environment. Okay? Now, how does he deliver those particles? He basically takes a syringe, as an Arabidopsis leaf, and he puts it on the leaf and he pushes as hard as he can and he tries to get some particles into the leaf. That's great in your lab, but imagine trying to do that in a real field and like, you know, where you have many tens of thousands of hectares that you're trying to, to, to treat. So that isn't going to work. Right, so this is what I found. Delivering, delivering nanoparticles to plants is very tough. Very tough. You can do foliar applications and spray them on the leaves, or you can put them on the roots. 
And we're looking at both of those methods and trying to understand how the nanomaterials get in and move around and how we can manipulate them. All right, so key questions. But how do they enter the plants? You know, you can think about, this is a sort of a crude drawing of a plant leaf, but there's stomata, and you can go in through the stomata, but you still got to get past this epidermis and into this mesophyll. You'd want to transport through here and get into the, to the vasculature of the plant, right? So, so leaves, a lot of barriers to getting in. This is a plant root of an alfalfa. This is silver sort of going up through the tip into the, into the plant. Okay, so, so both of these are, are, this is actually an XRF image from a paper we did a while ago showing how silver goes up into the roots. Um, and, you know, different kinds of plants, I think these are, these are both dicot plants and you can look at sort of the distribution of these materials. So we want to understand how they get in, we want to understand how they move around, we want to know if they transform or change inside the plant, uh, and we want to know what the speciation and distribution is. Okay, so. What I showed you before was X-ray absorption spectroscopy, which is this average metal speciation in a plant. Now I want to know what's the speciation right there, what's the speciation right there, and what's the speciation right there. I want a map. I want a distribution of the metal and the species, and, and we do that in these plants using primarily synchrotron X-ray fluorescence microscopy and Zane's mapping. All right. So the methods we do here, this is a picture of the Australia synchrotron. We go there because they have a great detector for what we want to do, and it's in Melbourne, which is a great city, so the students like to go there. Um, so we would take nanoparticles of some controlled chemistry, expose plants either to the roots or on the leaves, and then measure synchrotron to get those distribution maps. Okay? So this is sort of how X-ray fluorescence microscopy works. Um, you, have a, you have a beam that's coming in um, from, from, the, from the source, and it's usually a, a fixed energy, 14 keV or something of that sort. And then you're taking your sample and you're sort of rastering your sample back and forth. And you're, you're letting the beam go across and you're looking at the fluorescence that comes off while the sample is moving. And you're getting a map of the fluorescence in every pixel and you're doing it very quickly. This is why we go to Australia, because you can do it so fast the plant doesn't get hurt. I can take a live plant, put it in, map it, and put it back and let it grow, and 72 hours later I can come back and map it again. It's pretty awesome, right? It, only because it's so fast that we can do that. And then if I actually take that and I make a map at sort of at this energy, and then I make a map at this energy and this energy, and I make a whole bunch of maps, I can get Zane's spectra. Remember, Zane's tells me something about the speciation of the metal. So I can tell you whether I have cerium oxide nanoparticles or whether I have cerium attached to carboxylic groups or different groups inside the plant, okay, from the Zanes map. So I'm going to show you a bunch of XRF data and a bunch of Zanes maps. So one of the first experiments that we did was this one. We just put some gold nanoparticles with different coatings, citrate, and I have to say coating X because we have patents that are pending on this thing, or, or actually a pending invention disclosure at this point, but we'll turn into a patent. Um, we're almost there. But we, nonetheless, we used two coatings and we used different sizes and we put it on and we just wanted to understand, do these things move? Where do they go in the plant? Do they go to the roots? Do they go elsewhere? And these are, these are top ones are just microscope images. And what we found, if you put citrate coated gold on top of a leaf and you come back after seven days, you get a bunch of citrate coated gold on top of the leaf. That's what that black stuff is in the microscope. It's a little bit aggregated and you get gold. So some has gone in the leaf, I'll show you, but, but not so much. This other one that we get, the coating that we put on, gives us the chemistry to get through the cuticle of the leaf. We go back and you do not find any gold on that leaf. Maybe a little bit here for the biggest particles, the 50 nanometer ones, but for three and a half and 12, it's all gone. Now we take that leaf and we cut it, we make a cross section. Actually, we fix it first and do a bunch of stuff. We make a cross section, a thin section, 100 micron thick section. We turn it over and then we map it on our, our XRF mapping, okay? And this is what we see. For this coating here, we get, and it's, it's sort of hard to see here, but the pinkish color is gold. So you're getting gold in the mesophyll. It's kind of stuck in the leaf tissue. This is the vasculature. It's kind of stuff in the, stuck in the leaf tissue, but there's nothing on the top. Okay? Whereas the citrate, a bunch of this red stuff is the gold. It's stuck on top. It's this stuff. But the stuff that did get inside is not in the plant vasculature and it's not in the leaf. It is moved. Right? So this coating gets you through the leaf, but then it gets stuck in the leaf. This coating doesn't do as good of a job getting you through the leaf, but once it's inside, it leaves. So that's kind of interesting. 
okay? Now you can do, we do whole plant things too. We take these plants and we basically take these roots and we take these leaves, we digest them and we measure total metals. And sure enough, you find that most of the gold, this is size and different coating, most of the gold is on the leaf where we put it, either on the outside or stuck inside. Like about 50% about of it is on the leaf. The other half has moved. It's moved to the younger shoots, it's moved up, it's also moved down. And what's really interesting is some of it moves to the roots, that's the brown stuff here, and some of it moves and actually leaves the roots and is exuded out into the soil. That's cool if you're trying to treat nematodes or you're trying to treat organisms outside in the soil near the plant root. It's really hard to deliver something to a plant root, but if you go through the leaf and put it in the root, that works. And of course we have to test different things and make sure that it actually is effective, but it looks like it's gonna be pretty cool. All right, so that's coating on the outside. We've also looked at things like charge. How does charge affect things? So we take cerium oxide of different charges, positive, neutral, negative. We expose them to wheat plants. Those are the actual plants. Then we do our synchrotron X-ray fluorescence mapping. Okay. So, you know, when you do those exposures, you can measure how much cerium is on the plant, on the roots of the plant, so, or above ground. So this is the cerium on the roots, and this is like right away after we dosed, and this is over time. And then this is the concentration of cerium oxide in the leaves, okay? So some of it's, a lot of it is stuck to the roots. You can see these numbers. Some of it moves up into the leaves, and you can see these numbers are a lot smaller. So a small fraction moves up into the leaves, but some does. Okay. So the question is, what's causing this? And this is interesting. You know it's on the roots and you know it's in the leaves, but you don't know where. Okay? So we go and we start to look and we can create maps. And these are maps of the roots. And the, the lighter colors are higher concentrations of cerium. Right? So the positive charge stuff sticks to the roots like crazy, consistent with the root studies. Um, and the neutral ones are on there and the negative ones are kind of on there. You can see them. There's, there's enough cerium because if there was no cerium, this would just look black. So you can actually see the roots. And if you do cross sections, you can see the cerium is really stuck on the outside of the root. Okay, so that's interesting. It gives us a little bit of distribution. All right, and then you can play around too with, with other things. You can do the mapping, right? So this is my Zane's mapping of my roots. And what it shows you is in my highest concentration roots, I have the tips of the roots here. They're in this bright red color. It's almost all cerium-4. It's almost all those nanoparticles we put in because there's so much, it's all we can see. But for the ones that have a lot less cerium in the root tips, a lot, some of that cerium, not all, but some of it has been converted to cerium-3. It's been reduced. Now we don't know yet if that's cerium-3 free cerium-3 or cerium-3 associated with the particles. We believe it's dissolved in free cerium-3. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. Um, there's other interesting things too, like this root looks funny. It looks damaged. And a lot of cerium went into that damaged part of the root. And you know, what the nice thing about maps, I guess I took it out. The nice thing about maps is that I can look at um, like potassium maps and I can see that that part is devoid in potassium. So it really is injured. So that's a way to get nanoparticles into plant roots, go after the injured roots. So if, if you have a really sick plant and the roots are injured because someone's chewing on them, the nanoparticles can get in even better, okay? No, doing that in soil is another story. All right, so here's the leaves. The leaves are kind of interesting. So we take these, we take those leaves, and remember the, the positive leaf, the positive roots had a whole bunch of cerium on them, but if you look at the positive leaves, there's not much cerium associated with them. The neutral leaves have a little cerium, and the negative ones have a lot more cerium, and they're in different places. The negative ones went to the tip. That's this one here. And you can see all this cerium in the vasculature of the plant moving through the veins. It's associated with zinc, it's in the veins, it went to the tip. But the neutral ones, these guys, have this pattern and, and it doesn't make it to the tip. It sort of gets stuck and it's not in the vasculature, it's in the tissues. So charge is a big variable in where the material ends up going in the plant. So if you want to deliver something in the vasculature, you would use a negative particle. If you want to deliver something in, in the tissues, you would use a neutral particle. We're still sorting all this out, but, um, but it's an interesting concept. All right, and more recently, we've um, just, just published this. This literally just got accepted the other day. I think the proof, we're doing proofs and it should be online very, very shortly. But one of the things that we wanted to do was understand the pathways. If a particle goes into a stomata 
Is it moving symplastically, meaning through the cells, through cell membranes to get to the vasculature, or is it moving apoplastically, which is sort of along the cell wall pathway and into either the chloroplast or into, there's a symplastic pathway, into the vasculature, okay? Is it going through the cells or between the cells? That's really important to know, right? And whether it's in a plant or whether it's in a person, you might want to know these pathways. And what we did at NSLS2 on this line called HXN, which is a microprobe line, a, a mi mi microprobe mapping line that can also do tomography. Um, this microprobe can focus down to 10 nanometers. So this is about 20 nanometer resolution. And what you're seeing here is cerium oxide nanoparticles in the apoplastic space. That's a cell, that's a cell, that's a cell. It's in the apoplastic space in a root. So we know with certain, we never found anything in the cells themselves. So we know for a root transport, it's apoplastic transport of these particles through the roots. Right. Now this is really hard to do. You know, you, you got to fix samples and nothing can move because you're talking about a 10 nanometer spot size. So the whole facility is on this platform that doesn't have any vibrations, etc. It's pretty awesome, but it takes a lot of work to get there. The next project that we're going to try and do, not with this line, but a little bit larger line, we're going to take chloroplast. Remember, we're interested in getting things in chloroplast. We're actually going to take a chloroplast and do tomography, x-ray tomography on it, and we're going to understand where the metal is in the chloroplast and get a 3D picture of where the, where the particles are with the chloroplast, I think. We're going to try. It, it won't be easy to do. All right, so let me wrap up, and, I, and I've hopefully left some time for questions. Um, I hope that... I, well, I hope you're excited about this stuff. I get excited about this stuff. But I hope I've convinced you that these x-ray methods are really essential to doing environmental research on nanomaterials. Okay? So if you ever get a chance to write a letter to your senator or congressperson and say, Department of Energy needs more money to keep our synchrotron facilities running, you should do that. You should do that. They, they've been on the chopping block before. But we can't do the work that we do without them. It's just not possible. And there's been so many discoveries because of them. Um, we use them to characterize the transformations in nanomaterials in situ, in biosolids, in soils, in worms, in plants. Right? So, it's, so that's really important. We also use them to spatially resolve the distribution and the speciation of metal also in situ, in live plants in some cases. For HXN, you need, you need fixed plants. They're dead. That's just too small. If anything moves, you can't do it. But in a live plant, you can do a little bit higher resolution, and it works quite well. Um, Zane's mapping, which currently we go to Australia for because they're the only place that can do it. But NSLS2 is gearing up to be able to do that. They have the right detector. We need a good stepping motor, and we'll get there. Um, then we can get speciation of metal in every single pixel. Every pixel, and you can choose what size you want, you know what the speciation of metal is inside that pixel, which is kind of nice. And now this high resolution uh, mapping is, is available at HXN. And I think, and we've really moved a lot, is that these engineered nanomaterial based solutions for agriculture, sustainable agriculture, I think there's a huge opportunity there that we need to, to think about. In fact, I'm going to Sao Paulo tomorrow to talk about these kinds of things uh, to figure out if, if the people in Brazil are, are as excited about this as I am. Um, so with that, I will stop. And of course, I have to thank NSF and for an EPA did this one. And this is our center. And of course, we all the synchrotron time that we get, uh, we're very, very appreciative of. So thanks. It's a lot for six to seven o'clock at night. So I'm curious, um, you, your study is about plants. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, nanoparticles and how they are absorbed and transported within plants and how during these processes they are affected, changed chemically, right. how combined, recombined with other chemicals. Um, but have you looked at upper organism, I mean like uh, muscles and things like that, uh, which would be also part of the environment, mm -hmm. how uh, same transports and absorption would work? I mean, is, 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 in other words, is your techniques approach applicable to living? I mean, uh, organisms. Uh, absolutely. Um, so you could do, it, it comes down to sample preparation. So depending on what you're interested in and you, how you would want to prepare the sample. Um, but we've done 
uh, we did a paper some years ago with earthworms, for example, and we looked at silver versus silver sulfide and what impact it had on the earthworms and how silver was associated with the earthworm uh, what, and whether it had transformed or, or not. Um, so we've done that. People have done nematodes, C. elegans, and these kinds of things are, are often done. Um, you can do cells, you just have to fix them properly. So, you, you know, in medicine, there's all these nanomaterials. Mm -hmm. They are used for different purposes. Right. So you start with a given nanomaterial, and you hope that that thing is not going to change when it's integrated to a, a, a tissue or cell. Correct. And it seems to me the message you're giving us here, watch out, those things are likely to be affected by the body which carries them. They are. They are. Absolutely. So there is a message. I don't know if that thing has been really well studied in the field of medicine. Well, what's interesting is that the field, environmental field, has figured this out. Things transform, things change. We need to look at transform materials. NIH started, uh, funded a really big nano center in NIH, and they said, we are only looking at pristine materials. We're not thinking about transformations. We want to understand gold, and then we'll go from there. So they backed it, they ratcheted way back and said, we want to understand things with as simple a materials as possible. So that's what they're funding right now. They haven't even gotten to the point where they're thinking about how things change. With one exception, I think. So this concept of protein corona, I don't know if you've heard of this concept, if anyone has, but the idea is if I put a nanoparticle or I put anything in, in us, we have proteins blood in our blood, blood serum and these sort of things, they're going to adsorb to these particles and they're going to change the dynamics and the chemistry of the particle. So people are looking at this protein, said protein corona um, as a transformation that is being considered. But very few people are looking at other kinds of transformations. You know, dissolution is a really important one. Depends on the material, um, but you can dissolve over time because it's nano. There's a lot of surface area, high surface volume, high activity, and dissolution is going to be important. But all, almost all of these tools would apply to, to medicine and to human cells and to higher order organisms, and they're being applied. Environment, it transforms back to metal sulfides. Yeah, um, yeah. The, the regular forms. It, um, it can. So the uh, transport to the environment is not that big of a concern, but when you have direct contact, let's say with the plants or maybe even humans, it may be different uh, without the transform, the environmental pathway in between. Yeah, I mean, I. I think the main takeaway from the trans, I'm, I'm glad you found a takeaway. I wasn't, I was aiming for synchrotron because I thought it was cool. Um, from, the, from the transformation work that we've done, the main takeaway is the nanoparticle properties are kind of important and that's what everyone had focused on the property of the material, but it's the environmental properties that that material is in that actually drive a lot of the chemistry. And it turns out that those environmental properties in many cases are even more important than the original properties of the particles. So for example, you take silver. People were doing experiments with silver spheres and cubes and rods and saying, I wonder how these behave. I put them in a sediment, they all turn into silver sulfide and they all behave the same way. So it, it, it kind of didn't matter if it was a sphere or a cube, it turned into a silver sulfide. So envi the environmental conditions matter as much or more than the properties of the materials. That would be an important takeaway from the transformation work. <coughs> May I? Of course. You just mentioned your visit uh, to Sao Paulo, and uh, I, as I mentioned to you, that region, uh, it is a, they, uh, they produce crops uh, for, in sugarcane to produce ethanol and uh, here in the technology is, uh, I don't know, from corn, right? And one of your main conclusions is to provide sustainable development in agriculture. Mm -hmm. The productivity of uh, one hectare uh, of ethanol from, uh, from sugar cane is about 8,000 liters per hectare. Okay. Using your nanomaterial uh, technology, especially when you say, be in the leaves, be in the root. 
how could you, let's say, in some sense, increase the productivity of these these crops, and uh, what would be the time frame? Especially because by increasing the productivity, you are of course protecting the environment, right? Sure. That's your topic. Yeah, no, that's right. I was going to ask you the same question: how to make a better wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I, I, so this is what we're working up to. I, I didn't talk much about yield, right? But, uh -huh. I mean, at the end of the day, there's something called yield gap, which is the amount you could produce it, given perfect conditions versus what you are producing. And a lot of time you're missing zinc. A lot of our soils have been degraded and zinc is gone. And, or the soil is maybe calcareous. The pH is kind of high. And if you put zinc into a high pH soil, it's not available to the plant. Right? You, you can put it as much zinc as you want, the plant can't get to it because it's zinc hydroxide or zinc phosphate and it just isn't available. If you spray stuff on the leaves and we can get it to go inside, our hypothesis is that it's much more available to the plant, it's much more efficient to use, and you will get a big bump in yield if you do that. Now, where we're at is we're in, I have one growth chamber in my lab. I can grow some plants to about this tall and then I have to stop because I run out of room. If we want to go to yield, I need to do field trials. We really have to go to the field and show that this works. And there's been a couple of studies, I didn't show it, but there was one on eggplant. And the eggplant, it actually is a great example. Eggplant was grown in a fusarium, like a fung fungus infected soil, okay? So the eggplant wasn't doing well anyway. But then if you treat the eggplant with a little bit of copper oxide nanoparticle on the leaves, before you transplant it into the soil, they got about $27,000 per hectare more in eggplant than they did without the treatment. And the total amount of money that was spent on the spray to treat it was $55. So for a $55 investment plus, spray, plus the person to spray it, you get $27,000 per hectare more uh, in eggplant yield. So now that's, you're stacking the deck a little because you're growing something in a, in a fungus infected soil to begin with and people wouldn't do that. So the question would be, can we take something that's already kind of normal and, and make it better and how much better? But even if I could get a three or five or 10% increase in yield, that would be significant. Absolutely. And the costs here are low. And, and we have actually got other projects where we're looking at robots to apply these things to actually sense the plant and see if the plant's stressed, and if the plant's stressed to, to spray the plant and spray where the plant needs it, and only spray the plants and sections of the field that need it, totally autonomously. Right? So that's, I, that's the future of agriculture. It's all gonna be automated, and we have to just be more judicious in how we apply our chemicals. Right now we just put it everywhere, and most of it runs off and disappears, and we just gotta get better at that. Yeah, so, so you're saying if we spray the plants with all these nanomaterials, is it going to compromise the food? Are people at risk health wise? Yeah. Um, there hasn't been any studies like that. There's a few people that have studied whether nanomaterials in soils actually move up through roots and into the fruits. I just saw one recently about carbon nanotubes, and it was a, a tiny, like 0.0000007% or some, some pretty small number of what was in the soil or hydroponically grown material in a, in a crazy amount of carbon nanotubes ended up in the tomatoes. This was a tomato plant. So, but all that said, I wanna spin it around. I want to put these in your food. I want to fortify your food with zinc and copper and the nutrients that you, your body needs. If I, if I could put iron in rice, I could help a lot of Chinese people, hundreds of millions of them that are anemic today. So, so I do want these to get into the food. I just got to figure out how. T totally open question. We have no idea. So let's say I could get copper oxide or zinc oxide into your into your tomato or into your rice grain. Okay, I don't even I don't know if you ate that whether your body would assimilate it or not. I have no idea. So this is wide open. This is like the wild west of agriculture right now. We can. There's so many open questions that we have to still answer. That's what makes it great. 
Yeah. Is there any work that's been done You, you mean carbon-based ones? Yeah, like synthetic polymers. Um, well, interesting you ask. So we're doing, I have a project where we have polymers that um, can, I can put a chemical inside like an antibiotic. It has a bunch of polyacrylic acid groups in the core that can hold, uh, you know, various, um, uh, like, um, uh, what's the, what's the antibiotic? Strepto streptomycin is, co is commonly used on crops. It can hold a lot of that. And then it has this shell around the outside that's actually temperature responsive. So below a certain temperature, that, that, that streptomycin stays inside. Above a certain temperature when the plant needs it, when the, when the organism that's attacking it is there, then it releases the streptomycin. So our concept there is we can immunize plants. We can actually spray these on. The plant can take them up and just hang on to them until it needs it. So there's a little bit out there. There's a lot on carbon nanotubes uh, that's being done. Um, but we focus on metals in part because of all those methods I just showed you. It's hard to do on carbon because plants are just a big carbon and water matrix. But the metals we can see pretty easily. So yeah, but it's a good question. There's a lot out there. Uh, that can be done. And I keep an eye out for plant nanobiotechnology. It's coming. Yeah, that's, that's good. Any more questions? All right. Well, I'd like to give you a small token of oh. appreciation. Well, thank you. I have no idea what's inside the bag, but I'll let you discover. <laughs> that's okay. Well, thank, thank you. you very Thanks much. for having thank me. You. Yeah, it's thank been you. fun. Thank you.